I just hit the recording button. All right, so let's get the show started. So good afternoon, everybody from all around the world. We have our audience back today at another Crypto Wednesday show. I think this is show number 11, and we are really excited on today's guest, which we'll introduce in a, in a bit. Um, we would like to uh, welcome all the people from US, which is, let's say, really early for them. We will hear about it a little bit later. All the people mm -hmm. from Europe and also the people from Asia looking into the live show. So happy to see you in the show again. And for all those people that are watching the recording, thank you for watching the recording and also sharing that in your communities. Really appreciate that. Um, and maybe to kick off some ground rules, if there's anybody who's watching the live stream and wants to pop up a question, please do so in the chat box so we can moderate that and hand over the questions to, to Miko, to our guest speaker today. Uh, so we can address that. Uh, during the show, we will also get some of our alumni speakers, our previous speakers in the show, interacting with me, Gordon, and of course our special guest, which is Miko today. So we look forward to that part of the show also. Uh, but like I said, any questions that the audience might have, please put it in the chat box and please keep the cameras off. So we have optimal sound and visual system with our guest of today. So before I kick off and hand over to my friend Gordon, uh, just for the people that don't know me, my name is Sander de Bruin. I'm based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I've been in the crypto industry for about four years or so, and I'm happy to, to took the initiative together with my friend Gordon to build this Crypto Wednesday community, where every week we are hosting a live Crypto Wednesday show, and we are inviting our crypto and blockchain and DeFi friends from all around the world to share what they're working on, to share latest insights, to share whatever we can share to contribute back to the industry. And we're happy to took the initiative for that. Together with Gordon, we have got some very exciting speakers that were already in the show. And we're very excited also for today's show because we have Miko on the show and we're happy to have Miko on the show spending some time with us. But before we hand over to Miko, maybe Gordon, I see that it's still dark with you, so you must be still in LA, right? Yeah, I think for the moment I'm in LA, I desperately want to, you know, people are beginning to do conferences again in all my favorite places. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, favorite place, Kiev, is having one next week. But yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. And as I usually comment right now, it's dark outside. You can see it's dark. But as the show progresses, I'll get bathed in the dawn, the glow of the dawn. So by the end of the show, it'll be bright. Um, you know, just real quick, I'm, I'm an attorney who specializes in crypto and blockchain, but, you know, it's not the Gordon show, it's the guest show. So I want to introduce my friend, Miko Matsumura, if I'm saying this all correctly. Um, I just call him Miko. The, I've known Miko for years. He's been on sort of the, the international, sounds fancy, uh, speaker circuit with me. And he's always struck me as, a lot of people in this business are sort of, very smart and very aggressive and all that other good stuff. But Miko is all that plus affable, communicative, open. He's just a generally good guy. And so he's got a lot of friends. He's got a lot of connections. He's got a good way about himself. He has a good way of expressing himself. Um, he's a busy dude. So I don't know if we're going to go for the full two hours today, but we're going to get as much of him as we can. And Miko, thank you so much for joining us, us this morning. I'm happy to see your smiling face. And you're on my same time zone, aren't you? <laughs> Yes, that's right. I'm in uh, coming to you from Silicon Valley, so uh, I'm I'm pretty nearby, I guess. Yeah, well, com compared to our audience, you're nearby. I mean, we're, I think we're gonna spam uh, Xavier Hawk, one of my alumni speakers, is joining in right now. He's East Coast. Virgo Bras, um, he's somewhere. No, he, I think he's in Portugal. No, no, I can't remember. Hold on, Mr. Bras, do me a favor. In the chat, put your location. And Olga, are you in Moscow right now? Yep, yeah, that's right. Okay. You know, he's in Portugal. So there you go. Um, he and Sandra were bantering about that last time. Uh, Sandra, do we go, do we handle all the preliminaries? Should we jump in or? No, I, I, I think we can get started right away. So maybe it's good to uh, hear a little bit more about Nico's background. So before we go to the future, what we're presently working on, I, I know that the audience is always curious on, you know, Whatever happened in the past, uh, maybe Miko can share a little bit on 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 that part of his if, uh, of his life, if I put it in that way. Miko, tell us about yourself. Oh yeah, so I guess uh, best way to put it would be, you know, it's really been a long 
uh, kind of twisty journey, right? So, you know, I think if you go, if you go back to my academic roots, you know, I, I actually studied uh, neuroscience. So, you know, my neuroscience uh, study was mostly focused on computational modeling, uh, abstract neural networks, you know, and so in a way, the most linear way you could think about an academic background like that is, you know, maybe moving towards AI and things of that nature, you know, so, you know, but life, life never really takes you the way that you, you always expect, you know, things, things are very dynamic and they change a lot. And, uh, you know, so, so, you know, I, I definitely took a left turn and ended up here in Silicon Valley and, you know, really started focusing on, on blockchain technology. I, there, there's a lot of twisty passages in there, but, you know, I just thought I would let you guys maybe poke and prod and, you know, figure out, you know. Well, actually, actually, let's give us those twisty passages. So I, I'm sorry, just, yeah. we're, we do this with every guest. Where were you born, did you say? Yeah, I was actually born in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which is okay. in the, you know, in the Midwest, Midwestern United States. So uh, really, you know, it's, it's very different there from, from California. The largest industry there is uh, the dairy industry. So there's quite a lot of farming and agriculture. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a different scene from, from California, for sure. I, California has plenty of dairy industry as well, but, you know, I think that it's a, uh, it's they have other industries too. Yeah, okay, rumor has it. Yeah, good point. And um, how did you get involved in? Did I hear that correctly? Neurology. Uh, yeah, or... yeah. Uh, neuro neuroscience, which is sort of a cross-disciplinary study of of the brain. Uh, so you know, I've always been really interested in. Uh, human behavior and you know in, in some ways uh, I guess I you could think of me as a philosophical guy so you know because of that uh, interest uh, you know I was always really interested to kind of study that it was kind of in, in some ways it was kind of either that or physics so I, you know I feel like people with my temperament tend to head off in one of those two broad directions you know which is sort of either either trying to understand like what what the universe is or what the individuals are, you know, and I, I think given sort of, a, I have an introverted temperament. And so I, I tend to think about a lot about what this experience we're having is and what it's about. And so, you know, because of those proclivities, I really started delving into trying to understand uh, memory and long term potentiation, a little bit of neuroanatomy, you know, the hippocampus, limbic system, you know, and, and trying to understand this crazy, uh, you know, this this crazy noodle that we have on our heads. Mm -hmm. So you just said something that surprises me, but it, re it resonates with me. You're obviously very connected and social and verbal, but you just describe yourself as an introvert. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, as from one forced extrovert maybe to another. Yeah, it's it's you know I I can resonate with that. I'm yeah. I mean, I was extremely shy in high school, and I had to push myself to get out. And, and part of what I did was just like study psychology and human nature both to understand the externality, but also to sort of get over my introversion. I don't, can you, is that sort of, am I projecting yes. or is that sort of your path also? My yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give you kind of a really interesting, because from my perspective, uh, you know, I've been sort of in the public speaking area for my, my, most of my career, you know, and I got kind of a kicked off with a bang uh, back in the early nineties because I, I became a, essentially a developer, evangelist and a spokesperson for the Java programming language and technology mm -hmm. at Sun Microsystems, you know, so I was I was on stage for uh, events like Java one in the Moscone Center, there'd be like, you know, 15,000 developers all piled into a big giant room. And you know, so yeah. so but you know, how, how did how, how does an introvert survive that kind of an environment, um, you know, yeah. I think what it has to do with, in my case, is I think from the get go, you know, if you're like when I grew up in Wisconsin mm -hmm. uh, and later we moved to Michigan, uh, you know, it, it's it, there aren't that there weren't that many Japanese kids there. <laughs> you know, it was like me yeah. and my brother. And, and so in a way, like uh, you start kind of sticking out early, you know, and so I think because because of that experience, uh, you know, in a way, I, it, I became kind of comfortable. One of the things that people experience when they're in public speaking is just this experience of separation. 
So, you know, they experience this feeling that they're somehow being singled out or called out or they're not part of the group anymore, you know. And the thing that was interesting about my upbringing is... Is, really that, is led... that a positive or negative thing, that, would you say? Uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it was negative at the time, but it's positive now, right? Which is that it, it, it makes me very comfortable with the idea that I'm, I'm not kind of in the safety of the group. Right. That mm -hmm. I, I'm just kind of like, OK, you're being singled out now, you know, and, you know, at the time it was, you know, being singled out and maybe not in such a great way. But like, you know, I think now I'm just kind of comfortable with it. And I think the thing that that has done, you know, career wise is it's sort of enabled me to just be uh, myself more because in a way you can just at that point, you know, you don't have to conform. You know, you can, you can pretty much be whatever, you know, and, and people kind of have to accept whatever that is, you know, cause you, you've kind of given up on conformity because it was never really offered. Mm -hmm. Interesting way of looking at it. You know, one, one thing I, one thing I did was start hosting events because I was so nervous in crowds that like attending a party was not good, great for me, but I hosted events because as the host, you always have an excuse to talk to someone and say, how's it going? You know, is it okay? You know, are you enjoying yourself? All this other stuff. So it was like, it might, and then the follow-up to that was doing public speaking. And then, yeah, with enough public speaking, it kind of switches from a nervous fraud experience to one where there's like a pleasant adrenaline rush. And it's, it feels really good now. Like I, I love, obviously, you know, <laughs> getting up there and speaking, but the, the curve to get from the beginning to the here, I guess makes me really appreciate it. And, you know, I, I think everyone appreciates how you present yourself. You're, you don't give off any kind of introvert or extra or, you know, outsider vibe, but I understand what you're saying. You're like your own autonomous unit at a certain point. So how did you get from neuroscience to Java? I mean, I, I feel like we, you know, skipped Exodus right there. So let's go back. Ah, to that. There's a pretty major Exodus, actually. You know, I would say that there's, there are these two, it's interesting, right? Cause I, you know, I think the, probably the largest single influence on my life is my dad. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he had in his head from the get go is that, you know, we were all gonna go off and, you know, explore the wonders of science. Uh, my brother is, is working in a, you know, biology, he's a microbiologist. Uh, and, you know, I, I was kind of planned to really go into the academic field and to really be a research person. But, you know, it really, it turned out that like that didn't uh, sit well with me. I just, I wasn't really cut out to do that kind of research. You know, it turns out that I'm just as excited to read about the latest research in Scientific American than I am to discover it myself. And, you know, it's amazing to be, uh, the thing, the difference in the amount of work <laughs> it takes to read about Nobel Prize winning research and to actually do that <laughs> it's, it's it sort of uh, if you look at the uh, sort of reward versus the uh, you know the, the cost it, it's uh -huh. it, it gets to be really kind of not worth it you know so so yeah. you know I, I get just as excited reading about the latest uh, breakthroughs in science than, than I do you know generating them so so it's a uh, you know and you can read about like the work of hundreds of scientists you know as opposed to you know, just one, which would be yourself. <laughs> so how, how did your dad or your parents react to your epiphany? That reading really is more badly, <laughs> <laughs> really badly. I mean, my dad, my dad uh, had a kind of funny life experience, which is that he, he was a kid during uh, World War II in Japan. And, you know, obviously, as you know, in the Pacific front, like Japan actually experienced attacks on the main, on the homeland, you know, and so, um, you know, so, so that he experienced kind of bombing and, and all this kind of stuff. So he, he kind of had a, a, some sort of, um, he was kind of not a man of many words, but he was also kind of had a existential uh, fear, you know. And, and so in a way, the way that he sort of survived is he, he left sort of the post-war Japan and got a, a United Nations scholarship to study in Canada and eventually sort of got his... PhD. And so in a way, the thing that was so interesting about him. Sorry, let me make sure I got that straight. So he grew up in Japan. He was there yes. during the war. Yeah. And here you are, Mr. Wisconsin. That's yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. And so okay. what happened, what happened was, was my dad basically, uh, so after 
you know, so Japan was not was in really bad shape after after the war. Uh, you know, it was really bombed out, and you know, the economy was was not good, and everything was there wasn't anything really left to do there. And so my dad basically left. He he came to Canada. You know, and it was it's a sort of super classical American immigration story. Um, you know, he he actually had, uh, I think he actually had. 20 bucks in his pocket or something like that. But his plane actually got uh, um, laid over in, in Vancouver. He was on his way to uh, Alberta. And, and basically, uh, he had to kind of spend uh, all of that in order to kind of get a hotel because they were stuck there. Uh, you know, and I think some nice lady gave him like five bucks so he could so he could eat, you know, and and, and so um, yeah, so he basically landed up in, in Canada with with pretty much virtually nothing uh you know he he ended up uh he, he ended up doing menial labor like digging ditches you know at the same time as being a student right so you know studying and it's so interesting all of these kind of sagas because you know my dad actually in undergrad went to tokyo university which is you know the best pretty well recognized it's yeah. all uh, you know it's either tokyo or waseda in japan like though that's the kind of like the Harvard and Yale or whatever it is, you know, and so th those, those are the two big big schools, you know, so he, he, he went to a very reputable school, but you know, he obviously was poor as a, I think his professor called him poor as a church mouse or something like that. But, you know, eventually he ended up in this really odd situation where, you know, he, he got a job in the cafeteria and then he worked out a discount to his rent where he would feed his landlord, who was also his housemate. So, you know, it's, it was one of those oh, very- bring home food? Okay, clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the food that he brought home- Very entrepreneurial like, like you, actually. Yeah, the food was kind of picked off of the other people's plates and stuff that hadn't gotten quite eaten as much. And, you know, so it was, it was kind of scrappy, but, uh, you know, he, he definitely forged his own path in, in the US, you know, eventually. So to make a long story short there, like, you know, in some ways in his- mind and in his heart like um being on that path really was just deeply associated with survival you know and mm -hmm. stepping off of that path obviously had the opposite connotation for him so you know i think the idea of of one of his sons leaving this path that was known to be safe was completely disruptive to his psyche uh you know and i i'm kind of uh, narrating it because at the time he just freaked out <laughs> you know uh which is funny I mean, if you, if you just you know, if you look to me to the side, I'm 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 rousting along my speakers and interacting with people, telling them to join. So uh, my ears are with you, my my eyes may shift right, but I, I'm uh, of you. course, of course, no problem at all. They're, 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 they're spread over global time zones, so it's a it's, absolutely, it's a absolutely. So okay, to so so Java, that, that's really interesting. I mean, you're that's you're, you're one of the OGs, as I like to say. Oh, it's very, it's the, it's a, you know, it's a language that's kind of now turned into like a COBOL, right? Because it's sort of, it's less hip now. It's more than 25 years old and, it, you know, it's, uh, it's taught in computer it's science classes. It's a little harsh classes, to say it's right? global, but okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, it's not as hip as like Rust or like these kind of like yeah. new hipster languages. No, but you know, it's, it, it's okay. It's all right. Well, you know, um, Interesting. So you, you seem to have a blend of technologist and business person, uh, you know, as, along with sort of investor. Uh, so, you know, there's technologist, there's operator, and then there's investor, though. What, what was the first venture you were involved in? Oh, man, that was a disaster. <laughs> well, you know, uh, actually, you know, there's probably a lot to be learned there. You probably learned a lot. You can probably share a lot. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. I was definitely uh, kind of, you know, it's all about the school of hard knocks, uh, you know, so, so, uh, you know, so I came straight out of, uh, so Sun Microsystems was a big deal at, at during its heyday. Uh, eventually, yeah. it was acquired by Oracle in this kind of sad kind of end game type scenario. But like, you know, it was a pretty big deal. And, you know, I went through this very funny gate where I, I started, uh, you know, working with obviously independent software vendors and startups and, you know, these cool, these little hipster companies working on Java software, because in a way, developer evangelism is platform 
marketing. It's developer marketing. And it really focuses on, you know, all the developers building on top of the platform, right? And so mm -hmm. the thing that, that happened to me was, uh, you know, when you, when you focus on those developers, you end up also interfacing with venture capital, right? So at the time, uh, Ted Schlein over at Kleiner Perkins actually uh, jointly started a fund, a venture fund called the Java Fund in conjunction wow. with Sun Microsystems as its principal uh, limited partner. Because it, it turns out that like, you know, guys like Vinod Kosla were actually, uh, was actually a, a founder of Sun Microsystems, you know, so all yep. of these kinds of these firms and these companies were all kind of twisted together. Uh, you know, Sun, of course, had Kleiner Perkins as a venture funder. So the, everything was all kind of like part of the family, you know, so we worked with, uh, you know, those, those guys over at Kleiner Perkins to set up this Java fund, you know, yeah, and so I, I, I got, got I, sorry, I got to know one second. Did you ever read Bill Joy's Why the Future Doesn't Need Us? Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Bill Joy, uh, I worked pretty closely with Bill Joy both during the Java years and he, he actually launched a product called uh, Genie, which uh, was kind of a dynamic uh, network discovery protocol. So, you know, it was really all about devices kind of randomly talking to each other and, you know, forming this kind of instantaneous distributed network. It was really kind of hardcore distributed networking a little bit before it was cool. In some ways, that's kind of all predating and presaging some of the stuff that we're all talking about now in blockchain yeah. technology. But like, you know, for, for at the time, there was definitely a lot of cool stuff, um, you know, so, so I got, I got, you know, but his, he's, he really has had a lot of interesting uh, thoughts and, you know, obviously the future doesn't need us is, is a, kind of a cautionary tale about technology and very prescient just, because just a bit. technology... Yeah, because technology did not go the direction that we uh, had in terms of high hopes during during the early 90s. Like, you know, we really were, I had very starry eyes then. I was very enamored of the internet and the, you know, the beautiful prospects of connecting everyone and, you know, being able to talk about everything. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, I, I remember reading that. I remember reading, um, you know, the Ted Kaczynski Minobomber Manifesto, which was referenced in that article. And a lot of it, a lot of both have kind of come out and been true. I mean, especially the advent of AI. I feel like, you know, on one hand, everything moves faster than we expect. On the other hand, things seem to take time. I mean, that was, that article has to come out of a solid 15 or 20 years ago at this point. But now, you know, there's an article a couple of days ago about it, an F-16 piloted by AI beat humans 10 out of 10 times. You know, and you start combining that with robotics and nanotech, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, we're going to be in an exciting future. So I, I don't want to be on a total bummer note, but, you know, yeah, it's just you, you mentioned some of that sun and that occurred to me. So you're you, you, kind of steering you back. So you got you hooked up with um, Kleiner Perkins. It was a fund that was investing in Java startups and applications. And that's where I hijacked the conversation. No, 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 absolutely. So, so my first business experience was pretty bad because, you know, I, I joined an obscure uh, startup that actually was sort of super, super early SaaS software, right? And it, in a way, it kind of like predated, it was really a, kind of a SaaS version of something like SAP, you know, and so it, it was super early for that, uh, you know, so I think that I learned a lot about market timing. Right. But the other thing that I learned, which is a bit of a hard lesson, is, you know, I got, you know, a fancy title and I got a fancy, uh, you know, everything. But the, the, the issue became that the company actually didn't have any cash. Right. So, you know, eventually I, you know, so I, I basically went out there, uh, you know, and I, I learned kind of the hard way how to raise venture capital, you know, through trial and error. Right. So, you know, for for about nine months there, you know, I didn't have a salary. Luckily, you know, I, things, things at Sun had gone really well. And so, you know, I, obviously Sun stock had done really well. The options did well. So I was kind of, you know, pretty comfortable. But at the same time, you know, it was, it was you pretty awkward. Like your personal cushion, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, yeah, correct. You, you, like, know, you, you got the title to keep you warm at night, but you're dealing, you know, you're going into principle. Yeah, exactly. Principle. Exactly. Yeah. Digging, digging deep. So, you know, I, I think that... <clears throat> You know, I, I, lear I learned my lessons, you know, I learned the hard way about things like diligence, you know, and trying to trying to 
understand better these companies and, you know, how they work and some of the, you know, cause obviously I, I kind of went from the, you know, the frying pan into the fire type of a scenario, you know, so it's, it's, it's really uh very good, very good uh, hard knocks and, you know, they, 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 life, life is, life is long. And, you yeah. know, the thing that I think is really important is that like, you know, people, people, tend to project kind of invulnerability or superiority or you know they tend to project a lot of atmosphere of like this this uh you know su supremacy you know and i i just feel like uh you know you get knocked around by life and you know i don't think it's it does anyone any service to pretend that you don't you know so that, that that's that's what i wanted to impart yeah i, I feel you so how, how did that all dare I ask, how did that all play out? And then what did you do next after that? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it actually ended up okay. Like I ended up raising like five and a quarter million. Uh, you know, it was, a, it, it was a good round, you know, but the thing that was interesting is obviously, you know, if, if since, since, since there were all, there were a bunch of fundamentally uh, wrong things about the, the way that the company was was being navigated, you know, including some of that stuff. But I, I would say that, like, you know, eventually you kind of learn, you, you know, you learn your lessons, uh, you know. So for me, though, I kind of got excited about the process, right, which is really kind of the startup process, right? So the thing that was so great about, um, you know, the whole being part of the Java story is that, you know, um, actually, um, uh, Tim Haley at Redpoint, a, a VC, he comes from the HR business, you know, and he, he basically said, uh, you know, whenever a big star explodes in Silicon Valley, it just kind of scatters star stuff like all over the valley, right? And, and uh, you know, that happened to Sun Microsystems, you know, and so I had like networks of people all over the place, you know, in really interesting locations. And so because of that, like I was able to kind of pretty much comfortably have a series of roles, you know, in, in Java and open source software companies, you know, and, and I eventually kind of fell into uh, marketing, uh, which, which was an interesting role to play in startups, you know, so I, I joined a bunch of startups, uh, you know, had, had, had some limited, you know, hits, uh, you know, I had some, some, exits and you know it's it's been a, kind of a career of maybe 25 years or so kind of on the operating side working on startups so that 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 kind of constitutes sort of the backbone of my startup company experience and, and then every for some reason i think of your blockchain genesis story as involving evercoin as the first one is, is that Accurate? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, one of my uh, open source software startups was a company called Hazelcast. And, you know, a lot of people probably use Hazelcast without knowing it. Like if you visit apple.com, you're using Hazelcast because, you know, it sits underneath a lot of high frequency and high throughput transaction processing systems, you know, and it's basically in memory caching infrastructure technology written in Java. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, it does, it does this kind of elastic clustering, which is kind of amazing, right? So what happens is, is that, you know, it's open source financial infrastructure, you boot up a bunch of nodes, the nodes automatically join the cluster. And then what happens is, is that the cluster starts synchronizing memory dynamically using a database replication protocol, you know, also called Hazelcast, right? And, and it deals with really complicated situations, like so-called split brain, you know, where if you cut the network in half, and then you rejoin the network, the network has to actually arrive at consensus about what happened, you know, to the different sides of the network while the, the whole thing was split in half, right? And so, you know, the thing is, so what I- DNS back in the day? Uh, so, so, so this kind of thing that's really interesting is, is when you talk about in-memory transaction processing, open source mm -hmm. financial infrastructure, and you start to think about this concept of like, you know, what, what is happening in a blockchain, you mm -hmm. know, they, they actually tend to kind of be very similar. So what, yeah. what happened was, was that uh, my co-founder, you know, the person who was actually the inventor of the Hazelcast technology, uh, my co-founder, uh, yeah, it's, it was, it was really, uh, he first encountered 
Bitcoin during the process of trying to write a NoSQL database from scratch. So he was trying to build a database. And what happened is, is that he actually saw a Google text ad for blockchain and he just kept seeing blockchain because he kept like searching for things about database replication protocols. Mm -hmm. You know, and and eventually, you know, he was building this sort of time series database, uh, you know, and he eventually found Bitcoin and his first reaction to Bitcoin was actually to build a node from scratch. So he basically kind of had the node, joined the network, listened to So he's the kind of guy that just saying the easy way, right? Yeah. So his I'm sleeves being, were all the way up. Wow. Yeah, I rolled the sleeves all the way up. And then, so, you know, and obviously, if you think about what a Bitcoin node does, it basically listens to messages on the network, uh, assumes that every single message is a lie, <laughs> you know, and, and, and basically comes up with this really complicated participation in this hash race in order mm -hmm. to like, uh, you know, so, so, so he built a Bitcoin node from scratch. Uh, you know, as just as a throwaway, really, just as a kind of, I don't know what this is. I wonder what this is. So as soon as he figured out what it was, he got really excited about it. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of dragged me into it. You know, he was like, hey, you got to check out this blockchain stuff. You know, we're going to do a company together. Uh, you know, and I, I was I was excited enough about it that, you know, I, I jumped in. And, you know, by that time, I'd really grown to understand how to evaluate startup companies a lot better, you know, and, and in a way, the technical evaluation of the blockchain technology was very much kind of an if you say so type of a thing, right? For me, uh, I was like, wow, if, if you like this, it must be really interesting, <laughs> you know, so it's taken me, you know, years of kind of passively absorbing and chipping away at blockchain technology to kind of, you know, just actually get the level of understanding that that he had pretty quickly you know so you know there's divide and conquer so so how did this exactly do result in evercoin and what's the well so the thing that was funny about this is is that um the first gut reaction was kind of like oh this is going to be big we have to do something right so the first thing that we set up over there was we basically set up the exchange component and the exchange component is really uh modeled after like a shapeshift at the time which is sort of this web-based exchange right but you know it turns out that like you know being naive kind of west coast technology people you know we really just thought okay well this is an exchange and we're just going to run it you know but we started figuring out that there was actually more significant uh you know regulatory concerns in doing that you know and so eventually we became a fincen registered msb you know we started filing sars and you know we basically did kind of the buttoned up route uh you know and 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 because uh, of that you were early for that level of compliance yeah, we definitely were ahead of Shapeshift and, in, in, you know, going towards compliance, you know, because we, we really, you know, wanted to do things properly, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, we implemented, uh, you know, full KYC, which resulted in the mobile application, right? And so the, we, so now we have kind of a full kind of wallet experience. We have, uh, and we've added since then uh, cold storage into the, mm -hmm. into the mobile wallet uh, through a partner called YubiKey. And, uh, you know, so we have a cold storage wallet, we have a kind of, uh, you know, exchange that's built into the wallet, you know, so we have, we have, you know, so that, that was kind of the evolution of the stack, right? But, you know, it, as, it's so interesting, because I feel like when you look at fintech, it's like the technology stuff is all West Coast and the financial side is all East Coast. And, you know, so it's a, it's a very uh, interesting hybrid, I think. Interesting comment. Huh. And then the... Um, I guess your venture arm is Gumi Ventures. Am I saying yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me tell you about uh, Gumi Crypto's capital, right? Which is I had already founded this startup company with with Talib, and so you know we worked together, uh, and um, I got approached by uh, someone who is the uh, president of the uh, Gumi uh, US, and Gumi is actually originally a mobile gaming company. Yes. You know, and as with many mobile gaming companies, it throws off a lot of uh, cash flow, right? So what has happened is my partner uh, in Japan ha actually has, I think, six venture funds uh, that invest in everything under the sun. But, you know, this is uh, Gumi Cryptos is kind of novel because 
it's uh you know it's not a arm of the game company it's actually a, an independent venture fund and what happened was was they approached me kind of midstream you know and asked me if i was interested in joining you know the partnership as a general partner you know and you know i i you know i i was really interested in in venture capital since since obviously since 25 years ago and the Java fund and all of this, you know, and so uh, I did sign on, uh, you know, but the thing that was interesting was that I, well, I was already working on, you know, Evercoin. So, you know, I think we made an agreement that I'd be able to, you know, continue to work on it as well as, you know, develop, further develop the fund. So that, that's, that's been the story behind that. So uh, just to be clear, like Gumi Cryptos is a uh, 30 million US dollar early stage venture fund focused on blockchain and cryptographic assets. So it's very much kind of financial services, uh, whether decentralized or centralized, you know, that's, that's the focus because, you know, it, the core thesis is really that the blockchain represents, you know, the internet of value and the ability to transfer value. So that, that, that's kind of how that evolved, you know, and it's, it's, this is really kind of just a, amazing. It's been an amazing kind of twisty, journey uh to get to this to this place you know just because um you know it, it's it, it life life has a tendency of throwing curveballs yeah <laughs> no doubt interesting is it i i just got a name drop is it masuru or nogi that you know akumi nogi yes nogi is uh he's okay, the small world of i did not realize it was that gumi so yeah, Nogi is the president of Gumi yeah. Americas, and he is he is a shining star in VR in the virtual reality world. Yes. Uh, he's absolutely uh, ubiquitous in VR, uh, and he actually was a principal in making you know hundreds of investments in the VR uh, industry. So you know, I think Gumi has been a very big staple participant, and you know, Nogi is uh, you know a world traveler and a speaker. So absolutely, that that's that's our Gumi, and uh, you know. The thing that has That's been big, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So he was the one okay. that recruited me because they were looking for a Silicon Valley based general partner. And, you know, it's so interesting because I have, you know, knowledge of Japanese culture. Uh, you know, I have sufficient knowledge of the Japanese language. I'm very comfortable with it. So, for example, our investment committee meetings take place uh, in Japanese. Uh, you know, and I think that that's something that I'm able to kind of hang and deal with, uh, which is, which is nice, uh, you know, cause so, so in a way, uh, it's a nice, I guess, call it product market fit for me, <laughs> you know, cause yeah, I, I'm yeah. also able to represent a Japanese firm, you know, in a, in a Western context since, you know, I've lived in the United States since I was born, uh, never lived outside of the United States, except for maybe a couple summers in Japan. And, you know, so I, it, I'm, I'm very much kind of like able to represent the local culture with, you know, 30 years in, in the United, in Silicon Valley itself. So, you know, I think that's, that's it. Isn't that amazing? You know, when you talk about life being a twisting road, I mean, those twists allowed you to pick up the elements that were uniquely fitting to this specific engagement at the very least. You know, to, to be completely American, yet able to operate in the Japanese language and cultural ecosystem. And I have the technical background and also the business experience. I mean, that, that's like a, you know, you, it would have been impossible to plan it in advance, but here it is and it works. Yeah, impossible to plan in advance. Yeah, I, I think that the thing that's been, so, so I can tell, when I talk about like curveballs, actually one of the big curveballs that happened you know, almost 10 years ago, actually, is that uh, my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I went through actually a pretty big struggle, right? But the thing that happened in this struggle was, was I had actually had a series of kind of demanding foreign kind of bosses that were all kind of like slightly like impatient and angry. They were, mm -hmm. they were to me, they were all kind of in some ways modeled after my dad, um, you know, immigrants and like filled with energy, uh, you know, and there are immigrants from everywhere. They're from Australia, they were from Germany, they were from 
uh, Turkey, they're, you know, they're, but so they weren't Japanese, <laughs> you know, but <clears throat> the thing that was so interesting is that those were, uh, they're from India, you know, and those were people that I kind of looked up to and was like, you know, okay, these are my bosses, right? You know, so I, I had this attitude of toward the world where it was like, okay, you know, I have to work for someone like that because that's who my boss is, you know. And, you know, when my when my dad passed away, uh, I went through a period of soul searching, you know, it was a, it was a big blow for me, you know, um, him being probably one of the biggest influences on my whole life. And, and, you know, the thing that I ended up thinking is I ended up searching for like, well, who, who is, who's my boss now? You know, that mm -hmm. was kind of my question. You know, who, whose approval am I seeking? Like, what am I, what am I doing with my life? If not, you know, and it's, it's tough because when you're, you know, you get to middle age and you're still thinking about impressing your dad and you're still thinking about that kind of stuff. It's amazing that we're still, I mean, you know, I was that maybe I hadn't, you know, grown up completely, you know, until, until some events just kind of make you shake you up like that, you know, and, and so the thing that happened that was so transformational at that time was mm -hmm. that, you know, I began to realize that, like, there's that I kind of have two bosses, you know, one of them is kind of my own nature, right, mm -hmm. which is my personal nature. It's like, well, who am I? Like, that's in some ways, whoever it is that I am is my boss, right? But I think the other dimension that's really important is that, um, that nature itself is also my boss, right? That I can't, I can't, I have well, to kind how do you of. How out those two? I mean, Mr. Neurosurgeon. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the thing that's fascinating is, is that, uh, you know, the conclusion I came to is, is that if you really are fully expressing your own personal nature, mm -hmm. then you become kind of a force of nature, right? You become sort of indistinguishable from nature itself. Right. And so to me, I mean, obviously you have to be aware of like what the world is doing. Right. So if you're if you're aware of what the world is doing, right, that's what nature itself is doing. You know, but how do you fit into that? And the way you fit into that is by doing whatever it is that you're meant to do or whatever it is that you're supposed to do. Right. Which is you're supposed to express your own thing. Yeah, Marco in the chat says, you know, you choose your boss every day. And that that's beautiful. And that, that's really kind of where I arrived at some level. Right. But I think that to me, the, the thing that unlocks the puzzle for me is this feeling that, you know, like, like, if you look at someone who's competing in the Olympics, right, like, it doesn't matter, like, what the field is, let's say it's triple jump or something unusual, right? Like, when you see an Olympian doing the triple jump, like, you everyone wants those athletes to perform well and they're all kind of rooting for them and cheering for them right because they're so clearly doing what they were meant to do right they, they're you know like when you see someone who's competing at that level like the two things that you know in your heart is that when you see it you know that they've been training their asses off right but you also know that you're seeing people with incredible talent for doing these things whatever it is they're doing right and so to me, um, if you see someone who's kind of like working super hard, but also has unique talent in whatever it is, like mm -hmm. the rest of the world kind of lines up behind that person, right? They're, they're yes. like, wow, like that's, it's wild to see someone who's sort of in that state of self-actualization. And, you know, I don't <clears throat> pretend to be that person. I don't pretend to be an Olympian, but, you know, we all have to have aspiration, right? So, you know, the aspiration is kind of like, wow, like, can someone really be themselves to that degree? Can they express their own nature to that degree? You know, and, and then, you know, to me, like part of interfacing with universal nature is to try to see what the world is doing and what the world is kind of offering right and to me one of the things that got me excited about kind of blockchain and also bitcoin is that you know bitcoin seems to be something that the world is doing on its own like it, it's it, you know and and bitcoin kind of seems to be doing itself you know and so to me yeah. when i look out there i think this is astonishing right and it's a and it's a very beautiful natural extension of just open source software it, for sure and you're right it, it is force of nature like in the, the sense that it's it the the market or the consortium or the network whatever you want to call that's it, doing it it's so 
fractured into individual elements. It's nature like, and then nature is really like that. It's like, you know, no, no one seems to be specifically in charge of like how every rock moves, how every tree moves, and how every you know, drop of water moves. But it, when it comes together, it forms something amazing. Um, interesting point. And I, I like how you align yourself. You know, when you align your actions with your nature, you become a force of nature. That's, that was a beautiful thing you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, it's so, so that's, that's really been my kind of the thing that's driven me, you know, since, since that. And, and, you know, the thing that's been true, like I talk about kind of hard knocks, right? And I think that this kind of talk is really important for today because everybody's getting beaten up today. I mean, it's, it's not, it's a really difficult business environment. It's a really difficult world it's a difficult medical environment like you know the, our families are experiencing a lot of stress for various reasons there's quarantine there's you know uh, the thirst for uh, racial justice and equality you know there there's so many dimensions to the struggles that people experience on a daily basis you know so i i think that um you know it's it, the thing that's important to reflect on is kind of how we get sort of beat down, you know, but when you think about getting beaten down by nature, um, you know, it's also important to reflect on how that can potentially strengthen us, you know, and, it, you know, obviously it's also, you know, it also can weaken us, you know, so we, we just have to kind of like, you know, take our, take our licks and see if we can learn something from it. Yeah, and ho hopefully get stronger. Um, so what I'd like to do now is bridge over towards a combination of things. Bridge over to your present interest in decentralized finance and also use that as an opportunity to bring in our alumni speakers, hopefully in like an ordered, structured way. Unlike last time, which became like a bloody a bloodbath, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. Um, so let, let's lead off with you, of course. T tell us... You know, obviously DeFi seems to be the hot trend right now and everyone's pouncing on it. Give us your take on it. What do you see your involvement as? What do you find interesting? And then we'll sort of open it up. So go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me uh, dig back all the way back to kind of my biological science roots, right? So, you know, if you look at kind of the blockchain world, right? There, there, we talked a little bit briefly about Bitcoin, right? Which is sort of like the great grandparent, you know? And in a sense, like Bitcoin is sort of sound money and itself is a killer application that's working just fine as intended, right? And, and so that's, that's beautiful and a wonderful thing, right? But when you look at what's happened with the Ethereum blockchain, right? The thing that's so interesting is, is that the Ethereum blockchain is like a powder keg, right? Because what's happened is the Ethereum blockchain represents stored financial energy, but with a programmable platform sitting on top, Right. So the thing that's exciting about what's happening in Ethereum is, is that, you know, when you have that much energy, financial energy stored underneath, and then you have so much programmability sitting on top, like you shouldn't be surprised to find that the thing has kind of come to life. Right. And so, you know, this to me is kind of a natural evolution of that kind of energy plus structure and the structures are starting to accommodate the energy and move the energy around right uh, there's a there's a wonderful physicist at MIT Jeremy England who says that if you shine a light on a random collection of atoms for long enough you should not be surprised to find that the atoms have turned into a plant Mm -hmm. right and, and I, he's talking about an evolutionary amount of time right but like no, what I, is that? I get it that's Awesome. Okay. Yeah. What does that mean, right? The thing that's astonishing is, is it turns out that like uh, energy actually plays with matter and structure. And in a sense, what energy does is it looks for stuff to do, right? So the energy is like, well, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and the thing that happened in the, on the earth is that the sun shone on the earth for, you know, the better part of 4 billion years uh, plus. And then, and then, 
you know, the biosphere happened, you know. And so what's happening is, is that obviously new structures are being created, but it's all dependent on the energy, right? The energy is the financial energy. And when mm -hmm. you look at DeFi, DeFi is really now structured after the idea that these organisms are trapping energy through this concept called TVL, which is total value locked. So, so at some level, a species is defined by the total amount of value that it's able to lock, just like in nature, right? Which is that, you know, a species basically locks a certain amount of, uh, you know, energy that you could measure in kilocalories, right? So if you look at the seven point, what is it, eight now billion humans, you know, that, the, that many humans locks a heck of a lot of, of you know, of, energy of biological energy right uh, so so it's similar what's happening in DeFi. so DeFi is now kind of experiencing its cambrian evolution where it's sort of in a period of explosive growth of new forms interesting and, and the you know i have to point out that it's having these teething issues whether it's yam or sushi or everything else <laughs> what, what's, what's your take on that yeah so um I would say the thing that's so crazy about what's happening is that when you look at these food-based meme coins like Yam and Sushi, like what's happening is that we're seeing now this sort of, I guess, cybernetic interface between the programmability and kind of human behavior, right? And the thing that's so fascinating about the story of Yam, I, you know, I have a, a YouTube channel, uh, it's Miko dot com slash bits you know this channel actually i describe a little bit about the sort of yam apocalypse and the saga of, of yam tokens you know and i i think that the thing that was fun about it was was that it actually was de was sort of decentralized prematurely and and you know so yam started just operating itself right and the thing that was so crazy is that it had bugs in it from the you know, so if you think about it from the perspective of a life form, it's like a life form with like, you know, killer mutations, right? So it, it's sort of born defective and, and just dies quickly, right? So the thing that happened with Yam that was amazing is, is that it first went through a catalyzing community drama, which is that Yam was a rebase token at, that kind of uh, resets itself uh, you know, every, I think it was 24 hours, right? So the thing that was so fascinating about this is, is that the YAM token basically was destined to kind of reset. And the thing that was crazy was, was that uh, the, the YAM team basically was like, oh, if we don't approve this governance proposal, YAM will become ungovernable at the next rebase period. So we have 24 hours as a community to come together and vote for this proposal. But it turns out that the mute mutations inside of Yam were so bad that uh, even after the community all came together, they voted for Yam and, and it imploded anyway, right? So, so to me, the thing that happened that was crazy was, was that Yam was a governance drama and it was basically like it turned into this meme thing of like Yam farmers all must form a government against this common enemy that was impending self-destruction, yeah, yeah. you know, again, so they're uniting against a common foe. They're like sort of joining, you know, to overcome their self-interest and, and, and become a team, you know? And so this drama unfolded in front of everyone's eyes, a governance drama. And the thing that happened that was sad was that all the yam farmers got together, they voted for the proposal and the thing imploded anyway, because it turns out that there was another bug related to the improvement proposal process. So they weren't, they, they, even with the votes, they couldn't succeed and the thing crashed, right? And so, but what happened after in the ashes was that they created a system called YAM2 and yeah, then they, invi yeah, they invited the YAM farmers to swap their old YAMs, which were effectively dead for these new YAMs, right? And, and people just started doing that and YAM started rolling forward. So, so, you know, to make a long story short about the YAM farming kind of YAM apocalypse is that, you know, that is part of a process of learning. And in a way, YAM was a natural predecessor to something like sushi, which is kind of known as this sort of vampiric kind of Uniswap clone, you know, mm -hmm. and what happens just like in life is that, you know, there are, um, there are parasitic concepts, right? So if you look at sushi, sushi is basically Uniswap plus this kind of crazy uh, weaponized 
kind of token mechanic that just sucks mm -hmm. energy, right? And so if you look at biological nature, like, of course, that's going to work, right? Uh, you know, but the thing that's so interesting is, is that we're really seeing dramas, right? Because the pseudonymous creator of the sushi swap protocol, this uh, person known as Nomi Chef, basically mm -hmm. did some really shady looking things, which is that 10% of the tokens were actually being siphoned off to this thing called the developer fund, right? So it turns out that that ended up being about $13 million worth of the sushi token. And what happened is, is that the pseudonymous creator, Nomi Chef, took all of the tokens and basically cashed them out through a system called Zapper, cashed them into Ether all at once, just bang, right? And took, took this, took all the money, basically. Now, he argues that- oh, yeah, the I'm not sure that was wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was his argument. His argument was, was I'm a developer. I developed Sushi. That's the developer fund. That's my money. I'm taking it, right? So it was, so people, there's a huge debate about whether it was ethically wrong of him, but what ended up happening is it ended up creating this huge, you know, upset, right? And, and what ended up happening is that, uh, you know, the sushi chief, sushi chef basically appointed uh, a dude, SBF Alameda, who, who runs the FTX yep. protocol and basically said, okay, you're in charge. And as soon as that happened, you know, SBF Alameda said, okay, well, let's have a community vote and see who holds the multi-sig for this so that we can recover, right? So what, what we're talking about is we're talking about kind of when the technology breaks, then the governance has to take over. So, so all of these things are amazing learning experiences uh, in the community. Completely. Um, so I want to bring on our alumni speakers. Um, and <laughs> some, some of them may or may not be in front of their computers right now. We'll, we'll figure this out. Um, Andy, if you're, we're going we're gonna to start with A's. We're going to start with Saunders, good buddies. Uh, we're either going to do Andy or Alexis, depending on who uh, chats me first. Well, it'd be and great did, to see Alexis. Marco and everyone's going to come on, but a Andy or Alexis, are you... I came fast. to uh, Alexis's show in uh, Bangkok. Uh, oh, amazing! With, uh, with Yellow, uh, so it's it'd be great to see him again. Yes. Um, well, you know, the moment either one of them chats me, we'll we'll we'll, we'll yeah, be all no set. Problem. Like, Xavier looking fresh this morning. So Xavier, I'm going to ask you to unmute Xavier Hawk. Uh, Alexis, Alexis, uh, Alexis is not joining. Yeah, but so Alexis, you look beautiful. But we're we're on <laughs> Xavier, but you look sharp. Uh, Xavier, good morning. Good morning, Miko. Thank you so much for your vulnerability and sharing some of your story. I think that you have a brilliant view on all of the, the different aspects of the ecosystem right now, especially like blockchain going to biology. That what you just said right now is what kind of like blew my mind. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, I did put a question in the chat earlier when we were talking about Gumi and was saying, how do you navigate the messy world of valueless blockchain startups? You, you probably are looking at the team and um, do you factor in whether it'll expand beyond the, the, the blockchain community, let's say? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. So how do you know, how do you how do you navigate, you know, so that really is the the job of venture capital, right? So there there's a bunch of really classic uh, elements to it, you know, so for me, you know, if you look at something like the Sequoia slide template, there's 11 slides that kind of govern everything from sort of team to, you know, financials, competition, market size, you know, so there are they, everything you need to know. It's almost like a mini kind of business school lesson on kind of what matters, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, it, it you know, what it boils down to is it boils down to conviction, right? And when you talk about early stage venture, really, it becomes kind of a gut level personal thing, you know, and the thing that's so funny about when we talk about gut is, you know, we're not literally talking about, I don't think we're talking about the enteric nervous system as a processor, you know, right. where your brain, you know, there is a gut brain, but it's not, it doesn't have enough neurons in it. What we're talking about is we're talking about physiological signals coming from your gut that are detectable, you know, in, inside of your brain, right? And so, you know, if you have a queasy feeling in your gut, it just means that you're now tapping into kind of layers of processing that kind of tap into, you know, really deeper uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic, autonomic nervous system layers, right? So, so you know, it literally is kind of a gut 
process where, where, you know, you end up distilling a lot of information, but ideally, you know, you tap into your whole brain, you know, and, and you make a gut level decision, right? So at the end of the day, you know, you're really navigating by, it is pattern matching, but it's not necessarily superficial pattern matching. I, I had this kind of joking concept of replacing VCs with an AI, right? And the AI, what the AI could do is look to see if the person uh, had gone through Y Combinator and was wearing uh, hipster shoes, you know, right. in which case write a check, right? Like that would be the, the VC <laughs> algorithm, you know, but, 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 you, you know, it's, feel that it's, algorithm it's more. you're going to like fix the process, but you're just replicating the existing process. Yeah. And there you go. There you go. And, and the thing that's beautiful about blockchain is, is that you don't even need to write checks. You can just automate the transfer of like, you know, USDC and, you know, the, that's increasingly becoming the currency of blockchain investment, you know, these days now, like I had an entrepreneur that was like, I don't want to deal with this bank transfer thing. Can you just send, you know, uh, USDC right. or USDT? So it's a funny world. And the other thing that you had said that really keyed in was um, the, the fact that so many people come forth and are like, I am indestructible. And it's like, no, there are real world lessons that we have. And sometimes that vulnerability of being able to say, like I had gone through this thing that was really challenging and really difficult, but this is what I learned from it is very valuable. Um, so when, you, when, you, when you're looking at a startup and um, I, I, I think I got the answer already. It's almost like, uh, you know, let's get past the, the facade that everybody puts on and what's the real story? What's, what's really going on here? Yeah, it's so it's it's so it's so true. And you know, I on like I I my my parents are come from like a Buddhist society and culture in Japan, you know. And so I definitely take a page from that, which is you know I don't think people are escape like um, you know trouble, you know, like the world, the world. And and to me, like if you look at the foundational nature of the of the world, you know, they, there's always imperfection in implementation so anything that's implemented has imperfections in it uh you know there's never unlimited amounts of energy whether it be financial energy or solar energy or human energy or attention you know and then obviously there's always entropy so things are constantly sort of falling apart you know and so I think it's super important to be as real as possible and to acknowledge all of these things as much as possible, you know, and, and so then the problem becomes incredibly a gut problem, right? Because, you know, when people experience stress and trouble, the question becomes like, how do they deal with it? Right. And obviously uh, different people deal with stress and trouble in different ways, but like the thing that's common is, is that like when, these, uh, you know, entities experience stress and trouble, you know, how do people respond, right? And so mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the magic unknown, right? Because in general, the thing that takes out these small companies is sort of founder problems, you know, and, the, and you know, everyone kind of folds or collapses in their own unique way. And sometimes when people are put under pressure, they somehow outperform, you know, and that's something that is so complicated and hard to understand, you know, and in a way, like that's part of the world of early stage startups is, you know, but I, I agree with you with really trying to be as real and as honest as possible and to try to kind of understand how founders deal with kind of honest conversations. Like, you know, one of the things that's really important is, you know, how do they treat kind of investors and how do they treat business partners, you know, when there's all kinds of pressures on them, you know, and, and just the, even the process of relating to founders kind of gives you clues about like who they are and how they're going to be under pressure. You know, one of my uh, kind of uh, sort of self-help genre classic favorites is uh, Wayne Dyer, you know, and he, he said something fascinating, which is when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. Right. And, and he's like, why, why is that? Right. So his answer to that was because that was what was inside of there all along. And right. so what he says is he says, if you squeeze a human, just watch and see what comes out. Right. What comes out of the human is whatever was already there. Right. So, so, you know, it's not, there's no magic to it. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, to me, part of it is really trying to understand what happens to people when you kind of pressurize them 
you know, because life has a natural tendency to pressurize people. I mean, these businesses are all hyper competitive. And if they're not competitive, then you're probably not doing something that people value, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, so, so if, if because of that, everyone's kind of put into this pressurized box, you know, and the question becomes like, how do people deal with that, you know, and how do people deal with those pressures? And, you know, the, 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 the preconditions for performing well are kind of things like the ability to have hard conversations, uh, the ability to be uh, honest and self-reflective, you know, so the, all these qualities. And it's so funny and nonlinear, right? Because sometimes the opposite of those qualities are useful, right? So it's, it, it becomes a bit of a puzzle box. Brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, answering my questions. And uh, this has been a great talk, Gordon. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Yep. Xavier, we're thrilled to have you, alumni speaker, join in. Alexis Yellow, uh, the, the mic is yours. Go for it. Small question. So I have two questions, actually. So one of the things that, hi, Mike, Miko. One of the things that really worries me is, um, like when there was a DAO in Ethereum, like the original DAO, and everybody lost their Ether, and then you know we had the we had a fork and Ethereum Classic and all that drama. I'm seeing the same thing, you know. It, I really resisted getting into DeFi for like over a year because you know I'm saying this is so crazy. Locking all this money into a smart contract, it's like um, it's like so crazy, and I have been looking into solutions like, is there anybody doing the centralized custody? How can we fix this? Miko, how can we fix this? Ah, I love <laughs> what you're saying. I mean, it's super important. Uh, we actually have a couple investments in this domain, one that's unannounced, um, but another one is a company called Credo, Q-R-E-D-O. And what they're doing is really novel kind of MPC multi-party compute uh, solution. So they have kind of a novel uh, tendermint based blockchain that performs multi party compute on top of sort of a custody network right so it's a it really is a fully decentralized it's almost like a fire blocks but it's kind of fully decentralized you know so that's exciting to me uh, but I, I feel like you know we definitely need to develop important solutions around custody and you know how custody is being managed and optimized right but I, I think that your initial observations are are really sound right which is that you know this is a scary uh, thing that's happening you know and people are taking extraordinary risks in DeFi you know and and you know what we've seen with the kind of explosion of this is that like the demand for yield is sort of endless right but the thing that's so fascinating about watching this is is that you're absolutely right to reference the dow and the dow hack right because when you think about it uh like let's let's take a look at something like uh yfi or wifi or wi-fi right so you know uh it turns out like let's say that uh malevolent uh, owners start taking over the governance protocols, right? So for example, there's a tool called Power Pool that allows people to pool governance rights into voting power in exchange for monetary rewards, right? So now we're seeing this playing of governance power and economic power, and they're intermingled in a potentially toxic way, right? So if you look at a, the case study for that, like the EOS blockchain, effectively suffered from a validator attack by Binance because Binance actually separated their users economic power from their voting power and started grabbing up block producers right so all of a sudden all these like you know block producers started popping up overnight you know uh, all of them with like Chinese names right and it turns out that that's all Binance right and so the thing that's fascinating is is that if Wi-Fi gets commandeered through let's say through power pool and some kind of malevolent super whales that basically now start voting themselves all the profits, right? Like all the profits should go to my personal wallet, right? And let, let's vote, you know, I, I'm being extreme. Like, you know, that, that would be pretty hard to push through, but that becomes almost a, a governance 51% attack, right? But let's say that that's executed, right? So if that gets executed, all that's going to happen is that uh, Andre uh, Kranya is going to uh, basically set up a ZFi, right? So he's just going to be like, uh, I've just cloned the repo for, for Wi-Fi and I have this thing called ZFi, you know, 
And just like Vitalik did with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, like he's basically like, I'm going to be on this side. I'm going to show my ignorance. Can you explain that term, ZeFi? Uh, so ZeFi, ZeFi is just a joke, right? Because the token that they have is Wi-Fi, right? And so I've just invented this fictitious token, right? But the thing that about the so-called ZeFi is basically, it would just be a brand new token, right? But all that would happen right. is- would be, I'm sorry, now I get it. I just wasn't quick enough. And again, yeah, no, you know, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's totally like, it makes sense. And I'm sure a lot of people were confused because I'm just introducing a neologism on the fly, right? But like, you know, so, so the creator Andre is a lot like so many figures that presaged him, you know, like a Vitalik, right? So Vitalik says, I'm over here. This branch is going to be called Ethereum. We're going to call that Ethereum Classic, right? So like, you know, like immutability fundamentalists are like, well, Ethereum Classic is Ethereum. Like the, your new thing is like not immutable. It's this bullshit thing. Like you just invented that and it's not honest and it's not real, right? So it, that, that did not work out for the Ethereum Classic uh, purists, right? Like that, that, that whole thing was kind of like, but the reason why this isn't dictatorial and centralized is, is that it's all still driven by open source principles of consent, right? Which is that people have agency and they can consent to be wherever they want, right? And so if Andre uh, Kranya says like, okay, I'm going to be over here and on the z branch, anyone who wants to can come over here. And by the way, I will swap you one for one, you know, Wi-Fi with ZFIs. So co come over here and just join this network and, I'll, and we'll, all, we'll all be successful together, right? <laughs> That's probably what would happen, right? So I guess what I'm saying is, is that, uh, you know, in some ways, I think uh, this kind of almost moral leadership becomes kind of this last resort uh, governance uh, kind of mechanism, right? So, so I think leadership becomes interesting and we're all starting to learn and play, right? So the YAM leadership became important. The sushi leadership became important. You know, we haven't seen the Wi-Fi leadership. The Wi-Fi leadership has been incredibly important, but we haven't seen a crisis yet where it's been, you know, forced to fork itself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that that may come, and, you know, so we, we, it's a, it, that's, it's so interesting to see this interplay between kind of what the world of code Right, because code, people say code is law. It's kind of not quite the case, you know, and we, we still need uh, human, code is human a endeavor. And Alexis, I think you had a follow-up question. Actually, yeah. I, I, the, more you, the more I hear, the more questions I have. So. <laughs> well, okay, well, you, you got one more bite of the apple and then we're going to Andy, but, you, okay, but okay. then we may okay. circle back um, around after Marco also. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I think tomorrow we'll have a, a Z5 token somewhere, somebody in the audience will launch it. <laughs> no, but That's uh, good, yeah. no, seriously. Um, so, so from the trading and um, from the trading and investment perspective, you think this uh, DeFi is just like a new ICO, ICO uh, like bubble? Uh, that's going to burst and there's going to, or do you think this is really like, because uh, I see some projects that have the potential to really like, uh, like kick the banksters out of the of the world you know like uh, become the new like the centralized everybody can become a bank uh, so wh what's what's your take on this yeah uh so i i'm uh, first of all it's gratifying to get the chance to connect with you uh again uh, but i i the second thing i want to say in response to your question is is that i'm the guy that says everything is a bubble bitcoin's a bubble and the universe is a bubble the universe is like a almost 14 billion year long bubble, you know, uh, you know, so I guess is DeFi a bubble? Like I was the guy that on my channel created a video called DeFi will collapse, right? It's just a flat out certainty that it will collapse, right? But the point being that, ah, when, <laughs> right? And the answer becomes like, it will collapse during a non-linearity that we didn't predict when too much risk is being absorbed and too much leverage is being applied, right? So, you know, it's, it's almost stupid for me to say that, but, you know, the way I model when it will collapse is actually related to the extent to which the entire system resembles this complexity theory model called the self-organized criticality. Right, which is essentially when you're piling snow on top of the mountain, you know, when, when do we get the big avalanche, right? So, so, you know, to me, the thing that's so interesting becomes that these minor avalanches are actually really good news, 
right? The more small avalanches we have, the less likely there will be to have a big avalanche, right? So um, I think the thing that's so great is like we had like a Black Thursday MakerDAO uh, unpegging. Recently, Maker just announced the DAI, uh, sort of new DAI protocol that kind of actually helps, right? So now that we had this Ethereum local dip, right? For example, Wi-Fi vaults now have slightly different DAI incentivization mechanics, right? So what's happening is, is that the network is kind of experiencing stress tests, right? So to me, the more minor collapses we have, like things like the Yampocalypse was actually great for DeFi, right? Because so to me, these minor collapses are great signs. Like if you don't have minor collapses, then you're definitely headed for a major collapse. Because every time we have a minor collapse, the network learns and it, it, it strengthens and improves right so so th this is this is a, a good one yeah everyone should definitely study self-organized criticality uh it's the work of a complexity theorist uh pair and it's it's astonishingly valuable from an insight perspective in understanding how these non-linear self-referential systems pile energy and how that energy kind of collapses how it rises and how it collapses it 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 suggests that these not these systems either need to be linearized, you know, because mm -hmm. real life doesn't model abstract systems perfectly, right? So you can't say like, oh, DeFi is a self-organized criticality. That's stupid, right? Of course it's not. It's because self-organized criticality is an abstract mathematical model. What you can say is you can say that at, at times it models an, an SOC and at other times it does not model an SOC, right? And the extent to which, you know, those things, you know, intersect is, is uh, you know, I think it's, it's important. Wait, Miko, I'm sorry, but before we lose you, Andy, we, I got to get him on. So, Andy, thank you. Hey, man. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. All right, great, great. Hi. Hi, Miko. And uh, hi. hi to some of our friends here, uh, Alexis, Sander, and gang. Um, my, my take is almost the same as you. You know, everything is, uh, is almost a bubble. So, my question is fairly simple. Um, do you, do you, who do you think will be the next most dominant uh, DeFi coin? Or, 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 or maybe put it, put it in another way. Um, right now, Ethereum is, is the leader in, in DeFi. Will other coins or other, other main, main chain take over that position? Yeah, and yeah. I'm happy how, to answer how, that. How fast would I'm that getting be? I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, uh, I'm supposed to unfortunately jump on a panel imminently. So I've got a, I've got a jet soon, but like to answer your question about the way I reason about this is I feel like we're looking at a tree. I feel like the trunk of the tree is Bitcoin. I feel like the cluster of branches emanating from that is Ethereum. And I feel like we're no longer in the mood of Ethereum killers. We're really in the mood of Ethereum helpers. So whether it be things Whoa. like Polkadot or whether it be things like Cosmos, we're really talking about extending what's happening on Ethereum. Ethereum to me becomes a settlement layer. And so it doesn't require the kind of performance that everyone demands because I think what will happen is that layer two uh, uh, will, will kind of take over. So I, I think that's I think that's the the eventual state. So you know I obviously if you're interested in like coins that I like you know uh, considering it's not investment advice you know please jump on my show. It's you know miko dot com slash. We endorse Miko and we're gonna put it into the sh we'll put it in the show notes. That'd be great. So you know because uh, that I've I've interviewed so many great entrepreneurs there. Uh, you know like. Uh, Stani from Ave, uh, you know, uh, Kane Warwick from Synthetics, uh, Kyle from BZRX. Like, there's so many great DeFi entrepreneurs that have come onto my show. So, you know, please, please enjoy. So, uh, you can also find right. me at Miko Bits on Twitter. Uh, so, and Miko.com is kind of the hub. So, so I gotta, I gotta run. But you know, Gordon, as always, is super great pleasure. And you know, what a, what a wonderful uh, show you have. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, of course, to my co-host, Sandra. And we'll post this on YouTube. And everyone else, other than Miko, stay with us for a moment because I want to give, I want to be fair to Marco here. But Miko, thank, thank you. Appreciate it. Go, go you. Jet. Join your panel. Uh, and we'll, we'll circle soon. Sounds um, good. Xavier, Alexis, Andy, just, uh, I'm going to make you the panel to respond to Marco. 
just because I'm going to improvise on the fly. And, you know, Marco's one of our alumni speakers and a very good guy. So Marco, join us. Shit, man, you got me into work. Yeah, man, <laughs> you know, we're all working here. Marco's in the Caymans. Sure, yeah, let's, I'm uh, working all right. Hey, 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 guys. Since, since, <laughs> since, we are all, since we are all online, you know, it's, it's rumored that uh, the sushi chef is a Singaporean. Have you all seen, uh, the, have you seen the news? I, I saw that. That's very interesting. Uh, Tim Lewis looks I, like he's joining us also. Hey, Tim. I heard he okay. was Thai. <laughs> no, Tim, got a picture, you, had, man. you had another panel, but we got such a good group of people here. I wanted to keep rolling for a moment and give Marco the floor. So, Marco, pretend this is your panel. This is your panel. I Throw thought, a DeFi question at them. I, I thought you were going to give a oh, I was. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. Uh, uh, the 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 thing that I found. Can you hear me? Yes, now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, the thing I found interesting uh, around this whole thing was we delved into the the uh, sort of biological nature of everything that humans do. Uh, whether we like to admit it or not, uh, much of what we do, uh, as the minute it becomes something larger than a small group of people, it takes on its own kind of a biological life, uh, you know, survival of the fittest kind of concept. Um, and of course, parasitics are part of nature, and that's where all the scams come from. If there's free money slash energy on the table, something will evolve to, to take it off the table. Um, and that's where we get a lot of these uh, things like the, uh, the, well, the Dow, for example, where we had the, uh, uh, the guy found a flaw in the code uh, and exploited it. Was he doing the wrong thing? Mm, if you believe code is law, then no. Um, if you think it's not fair that somebody should be smart enough to figure that out, um, then that's a different story. Uh, uh, but now we're talking uh, Ayn Rand territory, which we're going to avoid. <laughs> the, the thing I found interesting was uh, about the governance takeover uh, issues that we're facing. And it comes back to something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the idea that uh, we have never in really, if you think about it, even in traditional intercha interchanges and transactional theory, had a solid method of accountability where we could drive accountability down to the point. Um, and that's where we find most of our flaws. Fraud is largely based on the idea that you can't put your finger on a person and hold them accountable for their actions. Um, so this comes down to the sort of the, the, the concept of a pan global uh, digital identity platform that allows you to have some kind of a accountability without disclosing all of your personally identifiable information to the world. And I, I see that as being a way to avoid things like governance takeovers, because in the EOS example that uh, Miko presented, uh, where uh, Binance all of a sudden found themselves holding onto a lot of EOS and decided they could just turn around and uh, put that uh, stake towards uh, their own validator pool and effectively get to the point where they were in control of EOS uh, simply through the deposits of their uh, trading users. Uh, that changes when you find out that uh, you know, if you hold accountability and you can see that happening instantly that all of a sudden Binance is gaining all this control via its users uh, rather than the users having that control directly. Uh, whether or not you actually do anything about it is, uh, is a sort of a commercial, social, governmental decision. Uh, but at least you now have a way to instantly see that that's coming. What do you all think about uh, from, from that perspective uh, of creating an accountability matrix for the world that goes down to the point, the individual, versus the current world where accountability is kind of amorphous? Okay, so we're gonna circle through the group. So you know, according to how they look on my screen, so Xavier, I see your virtual hand up. Yeah, yeah, so that, that was actually the question or topic that I wanted to bring up with Miko. The mm -hmm. idea of Ethereum and the DAO and uh, even all of these DeFi uh, extensions are really like, it's really scary to me because there is no accountability. I mean, we look at Bitcoin and we say, oh, it's this decentralized system. But if you look at the main coders, 
or the blockchain, they all work for the same company and they are part of the same organization. And if you look at how easy it would be to do a 51% attack on the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, it's mostly miners in China, you know? So we're not as decentralized as we think, and it really does come down to accountability insofar as that X and Y and Z, these people are accountable for something. As much as we want to remove that, you know, and the idea of decentralization, you, you can't really, and there has to be an accountable, um, an account, like there are people who are accountable to the Bitcoin world. They have no recourse. All of the users of Bitcoin, I mean, have no recourse to, uh, to hold them accountable, but they are in, 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 in their behaviors, right? In, their, in what their, their agency is over. So being able to properly identify, organize, and create a governance system that is sufficiently decentralized, yet uh, with you know, accountability is the way is the way to go. And that's, that's, you know, obviously, that's near and dear to my heart as well as as the progenitor of Firon. So that would be my answer to that. Interesting. Uh, Tim, you had your physical yeah, hand up. Sure, real, real, real hand up there. Um, so you know, two things. One, um, it was interesting, I was a part of the, uh, the, the EOS uh, takeover. And that was an interesting, again, uh, these are all experiments still. Um, this is where we're very much experimenting with decentralization. Um, and right. uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, so I agree with you on the sentiment that, you know, again, Bitcoin is controlled primarily by, by three mining operations. Uh, it's not very decentralized. Ethereum's 75% of Ethereum runs on uh, AWS, not very decentralized. There's different methods of kind of uh, the accountability for um, what decentralization is. In, in EOS's case, uh, D DPoS totally attacked through uh, the, the owners of, um, you know, exchanges. Uh, we were, we, I, at the time, I had been one of the, the top 21 block producers. I actually had helped stand up the network. And the moment that that occurred was the moment that I realized that DPoS was just too uh, prone to attack. And, and I really, you know, moved away from uh, that network or that network design. It's useful for something um, in the, on the bridge towards decentralization. Um, but by no means do we have the, 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 that question answered yet. Um, and then getting, getting to identification is going to be just in a long, long step. Um, you know, I'm excited that all this experimentation is going to come, um, you know, but, you know, we still have so much work to do in all, all, in all of what this is. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, happy that there is experimentation and all the things that are going on. You know, Bitcoin has been so great to understand and get, getting the concept of decentralization out that, you know, what a great teacher that that's been, you know. Ethereum has been a, a good movement forward having a central figure, you know, like Bitcoin, yeah, it is a bit more decentralized. There's no central ominous godlike figure in Ethereum. Uh, there's a single point of failure. Um, you know, since they removed Gavin, it's a single point of fa failure with, with, with Vitalik. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy. We, we need to start getting more into uh, identity uh, and identity uh, experimentation beyond, um, you know, the, the 90s that brought us digital solutions like, you know, the, 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 the one accounts from Hotmail and uh, different Microsoft solutions that were going on. You know, these things, hopefully with self-sovereign identity, BLS signatures, different things that are, uh, that our people are working on now will bring this next phase. Um, you know, but again, the, the, the real world is out there and the real world uh, generally isn't, uh, you know, there's so much of the real world that isn't identified. The, I forget the numbers, but something like 30% or something like that has no, has no identity uh, at this point. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if we can get people and move people on to uh, sovereign identity systems uh, that are useful. You know, it's really going to be about the ease of use for most users. Most users don't really understand. I mean, you know, I'm, I am guilty of this myself. I'm happy to click through with, with Google single sign on, um, you know, but ultimately it will be nicer to, to have the exper experimentation with usability uh, and, and things like this moving forward. And, and I'm glad that we can all, try to build networks that, that accomplish that. Yeah. Andy, or do you have a comment on accountability and how they build that in and how you think this is going? Um, well, I, I, I didn't get the whole conversation, but I did hear uh, Marco's question about uh, this uh, digital identity. Uh, as, as most of you know, I'm, I'm very pro-government. Um, I, I work alongside with a couple of governments in terms of uh, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency adoption. Um, we also help in terms of the regulations and, uh, and uh, just to be real candid, today I had uh, about close to two hours a phone call with uh, one of the monetary uh, authority in, uh, in Asia 
about mm. very similar topics. But but trust me, uh, many of these government uh, are still looking at the the, the concept of uh, putting all these things on on a blockchain, all your identity on the blockchain, all the uh, all the details on the blockchain, what should be on the blockchain and what should not be on the blockchain. I, I had this long conversation with Marco a couple of weeks ago uh, about this. Um, I, I think ideally that should be the case, but trust me, um, if we want to use this identity, uh, 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 date, you know, data identity for to, to catch the bad, the bad actors, I think this will not be a very uh, efficient way to do it because there's always ways for people to hide behind multiple identities to, to, to money launder, laundry, to uh, avoid AML uh, 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 detection and, and so forth and so on. So just to be real honest, I think we are still very far away from the very ideal situation where a lot of our profile can be kept in a decentralized um, manner. You know, so, yeah. so it's, it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible because when you speak to the government, you know, like, like in Singapore, our prime minister's uh, medical records were, were being hacked. You right. Know, and, and the information is on. Is I, 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 I didn't know that. I'm very serious. I, I'm very serious about it. Andy, yes. Andy, you and, I, you and I should speak. I was the first guy in Singapore to bring a blockchain, and we started talking with the, com the, the country of Singapore itself. So we should have a chat. That would be, that would be exciting. We should, we should. Okay, go we to should, the alumni speakers telegram group. I want, I want to see the action there. All right. Thank you, guys. When they see that. Have a great one. Okay. Again, great, great, great episode. I was just going to bring up a, a, a comment to your, your comment, Xavier, when, when you said that uh, you talked about accountability and recourse. I don't see a difference. I, I see if, if you don't have recourse, there is no accountability. That's exactly it. And, and all of these blockchain tokens that are part of people's like offerings, there is no recourse for the investor against the company like you would if you're selling equity and things like that. It, it, it's ridiculous to me how much people have jumped into this you know, completely blind without understanding what they're getting into. But, and with that, I'll sign off, guys. I wait, can't wait till the next right, one. See you, man. And I, I think we're going we're gonna to end on Alexis. I, I feel like I want to, I feel like I want to have you comment on yeah. this whole issue. And yep. So yeah. um, governance is, um, is a thing like uh, for quite, quite long, like I think it was Socrates that was saying that, you know, uh, do you really want to give, um, do you really want to let the sheep uh, uh, tell the pastor where to go, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, talking about democracy. And what I really liked about, about Bitcoin was that there was no govern, governance. It was in math we trust. And um, I, I, that, that was a powerful concept in math we trust. And uh, people didn't have a choice anymore. Well, there was all these miners and stuff, but let's say it, you don't give the choice to the people if you want something that is going to be long lasting because you know people are corruptible they can go into into clans uh, you see it in the in this tv shows i can't remember the name like big brother or something they went into all these clans between the two and this uh, this is what happens when you give um, the power to the people with governance i'm i'm all for um uh, like uh, in math we trust and governance, maybe in the future we have DeFi uh, governed by AI, that would be a thing. But um, yeah, that's my take on governance. I, but I do love governance tokens. They, they make me a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, market inefficiencies are great, op are great profit opportunities. Yeah. You know, so there's something to be said there. Um, you know, despite what I said, I, you know, Tim, I, I, I feel like a thought brewing behind that forehead of yours. I mean, I, I, the 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 governance showed itself i mean it, it didn't take that long for the miners to uh decide to make major changes and and then the arguments came between who really ran the code was it the developers or was it the miners we still don't have truly decentralized uh, uh you know the, the git the git repository uh, you know the actions and what's taken um you know uh blockstream itself uh, is guilty probably of, of, of kind of overtaking a lot of the governance uh, for 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 bitcoin um, you know, I think to, to Andy's point, it really didn't matter when it was 50 cents or a dollar. Um, mm -hmm. But now that it's starting to become more valuable, um, that's when people start to get power hungry and, and, and try to try to, you know, steer, try to try to take the reins themselves to steer more power to themselves. Um, you know, maybe we we'll, may, maybe something will occur later 
um, that will, will, will be as efficient as um, you know, uh, electronic peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, currency that was, that was uh, you know, idolized by uh, Satoshi and, and potentially not putting power too much into um, the centralized, uh, centralized either developers or, um, or, or miners. Now, I'm, I'm still hopeful that those type of things will eventually exist uh, when, you know, when we build out the rest of the systems, we get people comfortable with the ideas of what these are. I still believe that the breakthrough was the, the internet of money. Um, and, I, and I do think that uh, hopefully people will um, be able to kind of you know, trade in whatever they feel comfortable with. Um, and, and maybe that's, maybe, maybe, maybe there is base currency, maybe there's not base currency, uh, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to see different models. And I, I think the governance still is a, uh, a core concept for how we uh, how we enact and trade, uh, and you have to have some sorts of, of, of recourse, I think, and to, to enact and trade, or some sort of rules and, and, and rule set, and that has to be decided by by the people that either are participants of it or or, or that do create it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of governance and, and governance not modeling that, that does need to still occur. It, it's interesting. Will maybe eventually a truly uh, ungoverned um, you know, uh, the asset uh, exists or, or be out. Will will Bitcoin one day truly be decentralized? Will will break free from it? Uh, you know, the the the, the, sense that the miners that that really do own such a large part of the governance of the of the network. All of these things are possible. By, by the way, to me, to me, it's a little bit sad that you even have to say that. Like, will Bitcoin ever actually be decentralized? I feel like my my soul is going out when I hear that. Because all, all of these things to happen and more in the future of Byzantine fault tolerant networks uh, coming soon. I think everyone's working on it now. I'm glad that uh, you know we continue in this in this uh, you know in, in this community to uh, talk about these things and, and to, to bring them up and discuss what decentralization is, discuss what governance is. I think that it is exposing so many people that hadn't. Well, you about you bring up a very good. Were. You bring up a really good point, Tim, uh, and that is that most people think that cryptocurrencies in general are decentralized because the SEC has said so <laughs> or because the world says so. But the reality is we all know uh, probably internally here is that they aren't. They're just a little decentralized because you're still relying on the mining infrastructure, whether it's validators, uh, validator pools or miners, uh, proof of work miners, they actually control everything. The nodes control everything and the clients just decide which node infrastructure they prefer in terms of security and privacy and whatnot. Uh, until we get to the point where you don't rely on the node infrastructure, you're always going to have some centralization. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but, I, but, but I'm gonna call this show right now and say good job everyone. That's a provocative thought to leave us with. And that's something we can explore in subsequent shows, whether or not nodes are sort of these vestigial organs of early decentralization attempts, you know, waiting for the next thing to happen, we'll, we'll see. Um, I want to thank everyone for hanging out and continuing the conversation. I want to thank Miko in Absentia for, for, you know, being our lead guest this morning. Sander, my good friend, do you want to, do you want to land this plane safely? And Yeah, absolutely good. And I fully agree. I think it's really um, good to see that we are not only getting, you know, really really high quality guest speakers into a show but also our alumni speakers and upcoming speakers are joining almost every week we really appreciate that and we will post the the recording on our youtube channel so we can spread it into our communities we're looking forward to seeing all of you again next week we have an exciting show uh, appreciate all of you so let's say on behalf of myself and gordon thank you for this week we wish you a good day